All right, so let's get started. Today is our third week of talking about how God uses people like you and me as everyday missionaries to accomplish his purposes wherever we go, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, amongst our friends, amongst our family members, the people we come into contact with every day. So we're talking about how wherever we're go- we go, we're kind of ambassadors for God, for Jesus. We're representatives. We're trying to basically let the world know about who he is and how he is on a mission to reconcile people to himself, to form a relationship with the people that he's made. And so we get to carry that message. We get to be part of that mission. Um, In fact, one of the passages we looked at said that in the same way that God sent Jesus into the world, that Jesus now sends his followers, us, out into the world. And so last week, I let you know that we would be talking about three different ways that we do that. I said that we would cover the fact that we have a good message to share. Thank you, Paul. Uh, That we have good news to bring. That's what we traditionally know as evangelism. I said we would cover the fact that we have good lives that we can live to represent God. And that's what we talked about last week with how our daily life should be such that it wins the respect of outsiders, our daily walk. We talked about that last week. And the third aspect was that we have good works to do, okay? Now, I grew up in a good evangelical church. Nothing wrong with that church. Uh, Well, of course, there was something wrong with it because there was something wrong with every church, but it was a good church. But I would say that in that church and possibly in the whole evangelical background, uh, the first two are often emphasized at the expense of that third. So in other words, when I was growing up, I knew for certain that we were supposed to live exemplary good lives, okay? Uh, We were part of a a tradition called the holiness movement, the church that I went to, and so there was a lot of emphasis on behavior, on making sure that your behavior conformed to what was in the scriptures. And so there was so much emphasis on that, in fact, that there was the temptation, I think, to fake it a little bit, uh, to pretend things were going better than they actually were. Um, And there was a lot of emphasis on sharing good news, on telling people about Jesus, on sharing your faith. And that was whether they wanted to hear it or not, whether it was an appropriate time or not. You just pretty much, if you were a good Christian, you kind of talked about it all the time. And uh, they would teach you methods for sort of like slipping it into the conversation, guiding the conversation, asking the right questions. And, And it was all out of a very good heart. Those two things were emphasized. But I didn't hear a lot about good works, about the things that we did out in society, out in the world, to make the world a better place. It just It's not that they weren't for that. It just wasn't emphasized as much. And today I want to make a case for the fact that this is an absolutely essential part of our mission as Christians. That it's not good enough to bring a good message and then quietly go about living your good lives without actually trying to make the world a better place, without actively looking for ways to do good in our community, in our province, in our country, in our world. I think that this is absolutely central, that the whole New Testament calls us to do something more than just go about our regular lives. It calls us to do good works that people notice, um, to always be looking for active ways to make the world a better place. Now, I want to start with a passage that if you have been in church for a while, I can guarantee you've heard this passage many times, and that each time that you've heard it, it was likely used as part of an evangelism talk. I have used it as part of a a message to encourage you to share your faith. But let me read it for you, and you tell me if it really is about sharing your faith, about bringing good news. Start in Matthew 5, start at verse 14. It says this, You are the light of the world. This is Jesus talking in his famous Sermon on the Mount. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Is that passage really about evangelism? 
I mean, maybe in a roundabout way. Maybe evangelism goes along with it. But what Jesus says or equates with shining your light before others is them seeing what? Your good deeds. It really is about our good deeds and what we do. And it's about letting other people see our good deeds or our good works, not so that we get any better. Because a couple pa paragraphs later, Jesus actually discourages people who go around and pretend to be righteous so that other people notice them. But this is about doing good deeds as a way of shining out a light, as a way of pointing people to God. Now, I don't know if you can imagine the idea of traveling back then and how utterly dark the landscape would be. How, you know, you don't have flashlights. Maybe you have maybe a torch or a little candle, and you're traveling, and it's dark, and you can't see anything, and you're kind of lost, and you were hoping to get to the town by nightfall, but you didn't, so you're out in the wilderness, and it's pitch black. How do you feel? You feel scared. You feel lost. You feel alone. You don't really know where you're going or how long it's going to take you to get home. And you round a bend, and you see the light of a thousand little oil lamps burning in a thousand little rooms in this little town on a hill. And those little oil lamps don't really mean anything in and of themselves, but they represent something. They represent the way home. They represent where there's going to be friends, where there's going to be people who are ready to embrace you. They represent a place where you'll feel safe and finally at rest. And I think maybe this sort of an idea is what Jesus had in mind when he said, a city on a hill can't be hidden. That maybe somehow when we do good works, when we do good deeds, that they function in the same way that that light, that town functions. That for people who are lost and alone and in the dark, they can represent points of hope where they see that little light and are drawn to it and are drawn home. And so it's not the light or the good deeds in and of itself that it really is all that important. It's what it represents. It's about guiding them home. And so I think when Jesus says that people can see your good works and praise your Father in heaven or glorify your Father in heaven, I think what he's saying is that somehow the the end goal of any time Christians do something good in the name of Jesus is that they would actually see right past us and see the love of God and see the hope that God offers and see what God has for them. So that's how I'm going to frame this. Now, before we get started, uh, let me just tell you that I dug into the Greek. You know that I like to get into the original language so you think I'm smart. Um, and this week I... I looked into it, and unfortunately, not a whole lot of insight. The Greek word for good, there are a couple of them, kalos and agathos, um, basically just means good, okay? So one of them, the, I think it was agathos, was uh, literally beautiful, but over the time, over time, it came to mean almost exactly what our English word good means, something positive, something that adds, something that is beautiful, virtuous, uh, something that, you know, is in inherently positive. So it's, it's a little different than the more religious words of righteous or just or like so holy. Like those are kind of have religious connotations and they have to do with our standing in God's eyes. Good is really just a human judgment. Like, oh, that's, that's a good thing. It's positive. It's beneficial. It's beautiful. And works literally is the word work. It's, it's things, actions, things that you do. So just to clarify, good works are different than good character, different than good intentions, different than good attitude, different than good ideas. Good works are actual things you do. They're actions you take. And so you put those two together, and what Jesus is talking here are actions that we take that are inherently objectively good they make the world a better place and jesus is saying that those good deeds those good works can point people toward god so last week we talked about just living a good life now 
let me help differentiate between the two because I, I've kind of tried to sort this out in my head. Living a good life means you're already living a life, right? You're already going to work. You're already, uh, you know, relating to your family. You're already, you already have a circle of friends. And if you become a Christian, your character should change in each of those circles, right? You should become, hopefully, better. That's not to say you were a terrible person before, but hopefully the Holy Spirit moves in and makes you better in the life you were already living. Good works are things that you wouldn't have done otherwise, things that God puts on your heart to do that are out of the ordinary, that show his love in extra special ways. So let's talk for a minute. I know that's a little generic still. So let's put some flesh to this idea. What kind of things would fall under this idea of actions that make the world a better place? What are good works? Help me out here. Just need examples. So, so I'm thinking more uh, concrete examples like uh, helping at a soup kitchen. Good. Okay, so now that you know what I'm looking for, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. I heard it. Snow blowing your neighbor's. Good job, greeters. Bringing food to sick friends. <laughs> yeah, you can s This is obviously legible. What else? I'll just say hosting or hospitality in general. Okay, yeah, so being present, available. And I'm going to put listening as a separate thing. I think that's very important. And I completely agree, but I think that would fall under my daily life topic that I talked about last week while you were sick. So, but uh, yeah, absolutely, we should change. I so. So yeah, last week I talked about how our daily lives, our attitudes, our our interaction with others should change. And and this week I want to really focus in on those concrete, actual things we do. What are what other ideas do you have? What about mission trips? To go and help someone out. Praying. <laughs> or an old dad. So what would you do if someone was hurting? Help them, yeah. Maybe give them a hug. Yes, so helping people, that, that is the classic good deed, helping someone, helping an old lady cross the road. <laughs> Giving money to your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> to those in need, to... Charitable organizations. Yeah. General, I'll just call that general help. I like the, the encouragement could be a note, could be a phone call. Sometimes, sometimes the actions we take don't have to be hard work. Although for some of us, writing a note can be hard. Email.
email, text. Yep. Uh, I'm also thinking about things like uh, tutoring, mentors. Volunteering of all sorts of ways. So, so you get the sense of what we're talking about here. Actions. These are concrete actions that we take that we actually have to go out of our way to do. Okay, they're not things that are th- that just happen naturally in the course of regular life, and we just have a different attitude about. These are things we choose to take action on to make the world a better place. Sometimes in little tiny ways, sometimes in big huge ways but they're actions that we take. This is what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about good works. Now, what I want to do is take you through a bunch of scriptures really quick. So this is like Bible study time, okay? And and I want to show you that this is not a peripheral issue in the New Testament, that that the idea that Christians, followers of Jesus, are the kind of people that do good works, that intentionally find ways and look for ways to make the world a better place without necessarily an inherent spiritual value. I want to prove to you just from the sheer number of times that this is mentioned that this is perhaps an area that, at least in my church background, has been somewhat neglected. So let me, let me share with you. Colossians 1 to 10, or 1, 10 uh, to 12, Paul's giving, uh, Paul gives a prayer for the Colossian church. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And so Paul is just saying, this is the preamble to say, I have been praying for you that you would grow mature as Christians in your relationship with God and do what pleases God. And now he describes it. So he starts by saying, first of all, bearing fruit in every good work there it is two growing in the knowledge of god getting closer to god yeah three being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might that you may have great endurance and patience they were under they were being persecuted it was hard to be a christian so he's praying for strength to to persevere through and four giving joyful thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light so the whole point i want to make there is the fact that as paul is thinking about what does a Christian look like? What do I really want these people to become as they mature in Jesus? The first thing that he lists is that they would bear fruit in every good work, these sorts of actions. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork or artwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God already had in mind good works for you and I to accomplish. He doesn't force us, but he gives us opportunities. He's shaping us to do that. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 8. Each of you should give, so here's financial giving, what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Help me find this one here, okay? So here's the idea of finances here. Uh, A lot of the TV preachers will tell you that uh, if you give to them, God will give to you, and that that's abundance, okay? The abundance word comes up quite a bit, that God wants us to be abundant, and I think that means he wants us to be rich and drive nice cars by sort of the implications there. But what this passage says is that God gives us stuff so that we can abound or have abundance in good works. Okay, so there you see it again and as it ties in with our finances. Second Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement, encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So there's a correlation here between, first of all, God does something for us, and then out of that pours our good deeds and our good words. The two go together. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
the point of Scripture is to what? Teach, rebuke, correct, train, and to help us grow so that we can be equipped to do good works. These kind of things. Titus 3, 8, and then verse 14 to drive it home. This is a trustworthy saying, and all I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everything, for everyone. And then in verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for the urgent for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. So just in case you were thinking, well, doing good just means living a righteous, holy life before God. No, he actually explains it as providing for urgent needs and not living unproductive lives or living productive lives, lives that make a difference. So he's saying that God's people should be careful, meaning pay special attention to giving themselves to doing good. Second Peter 2.12 says, live such good lives among the pagans or the people around you that don't know God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds, be thankful, and glorify God on the day he visits. Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I have heard this passage used a thousand times to encourage people to come to church. Don't give up the habit of meeting together. But I don't often hear about how the point of meeting together is to encourage each other and spur one another on towards love and good works, good deeds. So perhaps the most famous passage, and the last one in my string of passages here, that talks about the necessity of good works or good deeds or actions that go with our faith is found in James 2, 14 to 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. written by Jesus' brother, who, even, you know, watched his own brother die for us. It's a little bit of passion to his appeal to live a faith life. So, I want to just pause there. I've given you a bunch to think about, and I hope you understand, like I'm just trying to inundate you with this, to help you understand this is not optional, that this is part and parcel of the Christian life, that we're saved by grace, meaning that there's nothing that we can do to earn God's favor or earn God's love. That he forgives us, he wipes the slate clean, he accepts us and loves us, not because of anything we do. But that doesn't mean that what we do doesn't matter. He expects, he calls, I would even say he demands that our lives reflect the same kind of grace that he gave to us. That we show that kind of grace and generosity to the people around us. And not just in attitudes, not just in intentions or prayer, but in actual deeds, things we do to make a difference. What good is it to say, keep warm and well-fed, and do nothing to actually address the actual problem? So let me, let me just keep going here. I wanted to, uh, to talk about a little bit about why these are so important. But I think it's becoming clear Right, that, that what we do, how we express our faith, proves not only to ourselves but to the world around us that there's something genuine to our message. That if we say we have faith and we've got this incredibly good message but our lives don't reflect that, it's kind of meaningless. So I want to keep going here. Um, one of the main tac- attacks against Christianity today is the idea that religion only brings negative things. Have you, have you heard this before? Like there's sort of a, a general sense out there that religion over the centuries has only brought about negative, uh, 
Christopher Hitchens has a book, I think called, is that the one called God is Not Great? I read it a while back. And, and it's just sort of this angry diatribe against religion. And it recounts all of the wars and injustice and oppression and bigotry and all these things that human beings have done to each other using Jesus' name or d- using the name of the church or the power of the church to do it. And I hear this, this message being played over and over again that the ch- history of the church is one of violence and negativity. But I don't hear much talk about all the good that's been done in Jesus' name. And if you go back through history, it hasn't just been the negative and the terrible. But over the last 2,000 years, we have this rich, rich heritage of the true followers of Jesus who actually followed Jesus and not pretended to follow Jesus to get power, who did incredible self-sacrificial acts of charity. They did good deeds, and that shone out like a light. We read in the very early church in the book of Acts about this church that, that didn't just care about spiritual things in the world, but actually cared about concrete good. And so the very first time we see the church in crisis over leadership, it's because they've started this program to feed poor widows. Okay, And they're feeding these poor widows, and this thing has gone so out of hand, it's become such a huge deal that the apostles basically can't handle it. The 12 leaders of the church say, we're taking all of our time managing this food program, which is wonderful and good, but we feel like we're being called to spend more time in prayer and in teaching. And so they say, you know, you need to choose seven people to administrate this huge program in Jerusalem to feed widows. This was part of the very original first church. It wasn't just about prayer meeting and Bible study. It was also about who's making the meals for the widows. And how do we get them to them? And how do we make sure everybody gets treated fairly? This was an important, essential part of the early church. It's not just a peripheral thing. They believed that the good message should come out in good works and good deeds. It's also clear from the New Testament that individuals lived this out too. I want to give you an example uh, from Acts 9. Um, Listen to how the early followers uh, describe, one of Jesus' early followers is described in Acts 9.36. It says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Now, the story that, that it goes on to talk about is the fact that she died, and Peter came and raised her from the dead. But often behind that incredible miracle, the fact that she was living her life as an everyday missionary in her own town, she was just doing good deeds. That often gets lost in the fact that there was like a dead raising, um, Not a dead raising, but a dead raising. Um, Anyway, the point is that after she died and Peter shows up and he's trying to get his bearings, one of the things the passage says is that all the widows in the town were there weeping and mourning and showing Peter the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Uh, By the way, (laughs) this is a good story. I read this passage and I went down to the church with the open door to to preach. Um, You know, a church of like, over a thousand people there and i made some comment about dorcas being a silly name (laughs) yeah exactly so i got an email from a lady named dorcas the next day it was kind i bet she's heard it before um anyway the point is you probably brought her back to her childhood the point (laughs) is that i didn't make fun of that name right then and I, I, the point is actually that this lady passed away, and the people who came to mourn for her were not just her friends and family, but there were poor widows in that town that she had done things for, made robes and other clothing, provided for their needs, and they were mourning for her and missing her. And I remember early on when I started this church, uh, a pastor named Erwin McManus, I was listening to him preach, and he said, if your church went away, would anybody in your community complain about it besides her own members. And I remember being just captured by that idea. <laughs> Emotionally thinking, so many churches I've been a part of haven't done a lick of good in their own community besides just putting on church services for their own members. And I thought, 
we are not going to be that church. And if Muskogee Community Church starts up and then it ends, I want people in our town to go, where is that church that did those good works, those good deeds? And I still want that. I think we are off to a good start, but I want to keep doing that. I like the fact that mourning for Dorcas were the people that she had done good for. Wouldn't it be great at all, each of our funerals for people to show up and say, I'm going to miss that person because they did so much good for me. They weren't my family. They weren't really friends, but they reached out. They took action. They did something that made a difference in my life. I think it's important to understand we're part of this rich, rich tradition. If you go back uh, throughout history, you can see all kinds of incredible and amazing self-sacrificial, generous things done in the name of Jesus. One of the things that gets overlooked sometimes as they look at the spread of Christianity is starting around 165 AD, there were a number of epidemics or pandemics that hit the Roman world, plagues that came in and killed a lot of people. And when those things spread around, of course, the smart thing to do if you lived in a city, once the plague hit your city and was being spread around, the germs and stuff, the smart thing would be to get out of the city. And if you had means to do that, that's what you did. You left the infected city until the infected people died and it was safe to come back. And one of the things that Christians were known for was that they intentionally made the choice to stay and treat the sick. And many of them got sick and died and gave their own lives in order to stay in these cities that were hit by plague. But you know what happened was that people around them started noticing their good works. And they started saying, what is that about? What kind of a love? What kind of a what kind of religion leads to that kind of action? And that was one of the reasons that Christianity spread back then even before it was legal, even when you could get killed for it, because the character, the good character, came out in good actions and pointed to a God who was very good. So uh, actually another example, by the way, is the fact that the first three North Americans to contract Ebola a couple years ago, when that was a big thing, were all health workers with Christian charities who were there in Africa because they felt called by God to help those who were in trouble. I think if you went through all the organizations in our town, the door, the Queen's Place, the table, you could even go to things like, uh, well, you've got the Salvation Army, but you go to things like the Young Men's Christian Association and the Young Women's Christian Association, which may not be Christian organizations now, but have Christian roots. And the men's coffee hour and the lunch at St. Mary's and uh, keep going. I think what you would find is that this this message that says only evil comes in the name of religion is really just propaganda. It's not true. Yes, lots of evil has been done over the years. But we're part of a faithful pattern of Christians reaching all the way back to Jesus himself who have taken this good message, and allowed it to shape good works and good deeds in our lives. Ephesians 2.10 sem- 2 says that we're God's artwork, that he's creating something out of us, and that what he's creating has something to do with good works, good deeds, specific actions that we take to make the world a better place. And that he's prepared those things for us. But here's the thing, it doesn't come easy, it doesn't come natural, it's never the path of least resistance. And God doesn't force us to do good works. It involves our free will, our desires, and our abilities. It takes courage, it takes obedience, it takes creativity to find ways to do good in our lives. But I don't think that we can read our Bible and say, that all Jesus wants is for us just to go quietly about living our own little lives and becoming more and more internally righteous without actually doing something good to make the world a better place. For some of you here, you're doing an incredible amount. God has used you in incredible ways to make this community better, to do good. But for some of us, we may be sitting on our hands a little bit. God may be calling us to step out do something. Next week, we're going to talk about the message because one of the reasons I think that my background, the evangelical church, 
didn't focus on good works is because there were other churches that focused so much on good works that they forgot that we had a good message to share too. But the two go hand in hand. If we're going to speak to our world and say we have a, a good message of hope and reconciliation and peace and salvation and all these things that we believe that we have, but our actions don't match our words, we've never done anything good for our community or for a neighbor or for our world, people aren't going to listen, especially this new generation, the millennials. They're already a generation that wants to make a difference in this world, that wants to do good. They're already a generation of activists, but most of them do it for humanistic reasons, just, just altruistic reasons. I think there's a more compelling story that we have. I think the idea of a God who cared enough about us to come help us and fix us should be the kind of thing that drives us to be the people that are the best at helping and fixing and reaching out and rescuing. And so let's make sure that we as a church and we as individuals are listening to what God is calling us to do, the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do that will become a light to shine to the world. I want to invite the band to come back up and we're going to finish with that song as just a chance to reflect and a chance to, to think about how our love and our actions are proof of God's love for the world. So let's pray as they come up. God, I want to thank you, um, first of all, that, that you are not passive, that you are actively doing good in our world. And that the very best thing that you did in terms of goodness is that you came to our rescue. You came to offer forgiveness and reconciliation. You came to give us your spirit. And I pray that that spirit that lives in us, which is your spirit, would produce the kind of good works in us that will point other people to you. God, give us creativity to think of ideas, to think of ways that we can make a difference. Give us courage to actually step up to do what you want us to do. And God, give us the same kind of self-sacrificial love that steps out of our comfort zone, that lays our own resources, our own time, our own comfort on the altar as a sacrifice to offer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us for this lesson?